Earlier this week, the Attorney General, Suella Braverman, gave a keynote lecture to the Public Law Project Judicial Review Conference. Um, I want to take a few minutes in this video to um, say something about the Attorney General's comments and to challenge some of the claims that she uh, makes in her lecture. The central thesis of her lecture is that courts have been interfering in political matters, that they should stop doing this uh, because it's none of their business, and that Parliament can intervene to prevent judges from overstepping the mark because Parliament is sovereign. Particular cases are focused on by the Attorney General in her speech, um, including the Miller 1 and Miller 2 cases concerning the triggering of Article 50 and the prorogation of Parliament at a crucial stage in the Brexit process, respectively, at the Evans case in which the court ruled unlawful a ministerial veto of a court decision in relation to freedom of information, the Unison case, in which the government lost its argument about the imposition of uh, tribunal fees in employment cases, and Privacy International, in which the court very narrowly construed an ouster clause that, if given its natural meaning, uh, would have significantly uh, impeded the court's ability to exercise its judicial review uh, functions. It's no surprise that all of these cases, and these cases in particular, are cited by the Attorney General. They're all particularly embarrassing losses that the government suffered uh, in the Supreme Court. Now, the core of the Attorney General's argument is summed up in the following passage from her speech, and I'll just quote these couple of sentences. She says, I accept there are debates as to the proper scope of parliamentary sovereignty and about how and when court should intervene. However, it's crucially important that we neither permit, facilitate nor encourage judicial review to be used as a political tool by those who have already lost the arguments. There are at least a couple of problems with this um, position. Firstly, judicial review cases can and do quite properly arise in sometimes contentious political contexts. The Miller 2 case, uh, which is one of the cases that the Attorney General criticises, is a case in point. There was a very important and very clear legal question in play in the Miller 2 case. The question was whether or not the government's power to advise the Queen to prorogue or, or suspend Parliament was a sufficiently broad power to allow the government to uh, cause Parliament to be suspended for a five-week period um, at a particularly sensitive political time, given what was going on in relation to the Brexit process. Now, that was obviously a highly politically charged um, issue. But at the core of that issue, there was a legal question about the nature and extent, scope and limits of a legal power. And as the Supreme Court quite rightly said in Miller II, the fact that there were these political controversies swirling around the, the question did not prevent the question in the first place from remaining a legal question. The other problem with the Attorney General's argument is the point where she says that judicial review should not be open to those who have already lost the argument. Now, the argument she's referring to must logically be a political argument. If judicial review hasn't yet happened and shouldn't happen because she thinks it shouldn't be available, then it must follow that the argument that has taken place and the argument that has been lost, as she puts it, is a political argument. But why should it follow that just because somebody has lost a political argument, they shouldn't have the chance to raise any legal objections they have to a government decision or policy, or to the way in which that decision or policy has been adopted. The fundamental error that the Attorney General falls into is in fact the very fundamental error that she charges the courts with. She mixes up legal accountability and political accountability. The two things serve different functions, they're complementary, they're both equally important, in a democracy, 
But to argue that legal recourse should be closed off to those who have lost political arguments simply makes no sense, either as a matter of logic or as a matter of constitutional principle. So what does the Attorney General think should be done about the problems that she claims she has identified? Well, she refers to the Judicial Review and Courts Bill, which is currently going through Parliament. But in fact, the Judicial Review and Courts Bill, which grows out of the independent review of administrative law that took place last year, the bill actually does very little that would address the sort of concerns that the Attorney General has raised. However, she says that several academics, and I'm quoting again here, have suggested that the bill could go further. The most consistent contributions on this front have been from Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project, which have put forward several papers on this topic, sparking constructive debate. She goes on to cite, with apparent approval, a Judicial Power Project report, which advocates far-reaching changes to judicial review that, taken collectively, would drastically reduce the court's powers. Now, it's important in relation to any discussion about changes to judicial review and about the proper role that Parliament might play in that regard. It's crucially important to distinguish between two different sorts of things. The first thing that Parliament might do, if it's concerned about how judicial review is taking place, is to legislate to address a concern arising from a specific judgment. The Evans case is an example of this. So in Evans, uh, Prince Charles uh, wrote a number of letters to government ministers and a Guardian journalist, uh, Rob Evans, sought their disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. Eventually, the upper tribunal ordered their disclosure and the minister, or the Attorney General rather, exercised a veto power in the legislation to override the tribunal's order. There was then a judicial review challenge, and the question was whether or not the Attorney General had stepped outside or exceeded the scope of the veto power. The Supreme Court held that uh, the Attorney General had stepped outside the the power uh, on account of the fact that the court felt that properly uh, interpreted the power was actually a very narrow one. Now, there are different views about whether this case was correctly decided. Uh, My own view is that it was correctly decided and that the uh, the court was justified in reading the veto power very narrowly, uh, given the fact that a natural reading of it would have um, cut across uh, fundamental constitutional uh, principles. But leaving the rightness or otherwise of the Evans case to one side, it seems to me perfectly um, acceptable for uh, Parliament to legislate um, in order to address concerns raised by a specific case in this way. It would, for example, have been open to Parliament to legislate to clarify the scope of the veto power and to make it clear that in the future it should be exercisable in a broader range of situations than the Supreme Court's interpretation allowed. Despite all the noise that's been made about this case, um, that in fact is a step that Parliament has never chosen to take or rather that the government has never chosen to ask it to take. So firstly, we have that kind of specific, targeted response to a specific concern raised by a particular case. But the policy exchange report, which the Attorney General appears to cite with approval, goes far, far beyond this. For example, in relation to the Miller II case, the prorogation case, the policy exchange digital power project report says Um, that Miller II should be reversed by banning courts from ruling government decisions unlawful on the ground that they interfere with parliamentary sovereignty. Now, even taken on its own terms, that is an extraordinary suggestion. The idea that courts should be banned from upholding arguably the most fundamental constitutional principle of all, parliamentary sovereignty, by uh, quashing government action that compromises that principle um, seems astonishing. But in fact, this is part of a broader set of suggestions uh, in the Judicial Power Project report, 
according to which the principle of legality, the principle by which courts will interpret legislation and judge the, leg the legality of government action by reference to basic constitutional principles and standards. The argument is that that whole way of deciding cases should really be abandoned on the ground that the courts are overstepping the mark by doing things in that way. That is a very long way, I think, from arguing that courts should quite rightly not involve themselves in political questions. And it's a long way, too, from the argument that parliamentary sovereignty allows parliaments and permits parliaments to address specific concerns which arise from individual cases. Ultimately, there's a fundamental difference between Parliament legislating to reverse, prospectively, a specific judicial decision and legislating in general terms to eviscerate the court's powers of judicial review, which is the effect that we would see if the Judicial Power Project proposals taken together were to be uh, implemented. One of those things, the specific response to a specific case, is a perfectly legitimate exercise of parliamentary sovereignty. But the letter is an attack on the judicial role as it's understood under the rule of law and the separation of powers. The fundamental concern here is that the claims that are being advanced, both by the Attorney General and by the Judicial Power Project, appear to be being advanced in order to protect parliamentary sovereignty. But the reality is that they are an attempt to aggrandise the executive, to extend executive authority at the expense of Parliament, at the expense of the courts, and at the expense of fundamental constitutional principle.